welcome to Seymour's World on ThinkTech Hawaii. It's a pleasure to see you today. I just got back from a trip to China, Thailand, working over there, and I wanted to do a show on China, and I wanted to do a show on what has happened since the Trump presidency came in. And to find an expert on China, I decided to go to a very good friend of mine who I feel is Hawaii's premier expert on what's happening in China. So I would like to introduce you to Jay Henderson. Jay, welcome to Seymour's World. It's not your first time here. You've been here a few times, and it's such a pleasure to have you on because I know from my travels in China, and you know better than me, I think you were there. I, was the, I started in 1980. When did you start going to China? Uh, 1977 was my so first trip. So you're, you're there a long time before me, and I was there, of course, for business uh, rather than anything else, and you were there not just for business but also for social issues, correct? Yes. At the time, I was with the group that hosted the ping pong team from China to the U.S., oh. and I did that for for from about 1973 to 1983, uh, going back and forth to China with um, athletic teams, with uh, performing arts groups, um, educators, etc. And then um, I did other things after that. Well, a lot of people would say to me, because they know my position on China, that I like China. I happen to love working in China. I happen to love doing business in China. I happen to love the people in China who I've known for 30 or 40 years now, almost mm -hmm. 40 years. And a lot of people say, well, you know, aren't they different than us? And I say, people are people all over the world. You have good people, you have bad people. I find China one of the most industrious nations in the world. When they party, they party hard during Chinese New Year. When they work, the rest of the time, they work very hard. So I am a uh, China aficionado, so to speak. What about you? What has been your involvement since the ping pong days? Well, rather than a China expert, I you actually, are a China I actually expert, call myself a China specialist because okay. I've been specializing in China okay. all my life and with the one goal of trying to uh, avoid having any kind of a war with China. Uh, you know, I, I'm a Vietnam War veteran mm -hmm. and uh, I was uh, very, very anxious uh, right after the war, right after I came back from Vietnam to avoid seeing that particular conflict uh, blow up and, and involve China the way that happened uh, during the Korean War when I was younger. Um, so I've spent my entire career trying to improve uh, uh, understanding between the people of China and the people of the United States in order to avoid a war. And that has been, obviously, you have done a good job because there's never really been, except for the, uh, for the politicos and the, and, the, and the military nuts guys who think that the war is uh, what, what has to run the world, uh, there really hasn't been that much of an issue, has there, in the past we're talking about? No, uh, thank goodness. Uh, we've had a number of uh, changes of political leadership, like, for example, when Ronald Reagan became president, where uh, he, before he became president, he was very close to uh, Chiang Kai-shek on Taiwan, and, and everyone was wondering whether or not he was going to continue the uh, policy of recognizing only one China and that China being, the government of that being in Beijing rather than in Taipei. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, he became president and a couple of months later he was in Beijing. And we've seen a very, very steady uh, U.S.-China relationship because of the policy run by the various presidents and the various administrations, be they Republican or Democrat that has been very conducive to stable relations, that has also been conducive to prosperity, it's also been conducive to peace. And now, of course, we come to Mr. Trump. And one of the reasons I wanted you to come here is because President Trump is obviously has been extremely divisive in every, in every sector of his, of his policies. When it comes to China, I don't see that much. He's talked a lot about trade embargoes and all that kind of stuff. What, what is, I, I'd like to know the last five years of what you feel has transpired under the Obama term and what you see for the next five years. The past five years have not really changed 
since the past 40 years, since since uh, uh, at least 1978, when Deng Xiaoping came back from the countryside and decommunized the countryside and uh, the, the, the cities and the countryside, uh, the economy, put it that way, and China began began to to blossom economically. The past five years have have seen a continuation of the of the steady course on U.S.-China relations. What we're having right now with Donald Trump coming in and having said some of the things that he said during the, the campaign has caused people like me to uh, worry a great deal about will he diverge from the policies of the past 40 years? Will we see a whole new era in U.S.-China relations, or will he also uh, be on board? Now, there was a couple of rocky periods already in the last month or two. Uh, one is when he had a phone call with Tsai Ing-wen, the president of the government on Taiwan. That um, caused some shock waves and caused Beijing to react, and a lot of people at the highest level in the government of China to worry about the stability of U.S.-China relations. But um, within the past week, we've had two um, encouraging um, uh, developments. One was a, an exchange of notes between President Xi Jinping of China and President Trump, and the other is just yesterday a phone call. Uh, between uh, uh, bet between the two presidents, in Isn't which there a meeting coming up between the two of them. Uh, nothing has been planned no, okay. currently, but there was, there was a reassuring phone call in which, at least according to the Chinese President Trump, uh, said he agreed with the One China policy. Don't you feel though that Trump, I, and I'm I'm not a Trump fan by the way, but don't you feel he's a he's really political, meaning that he may d say what he needs to say to get elected, but he's already starting to back down on a lot of the issues that he were that were paramount in his campaign, such as I'm going to build this wall and I'm going to send these people out of here and the Muslims are not welcome in our country, all that kind of stuff. Don't you think it's the same with China that he's not going to really do much? He may talk about it, but not do much. What's your feeling? The big difference between the Trump that we have known and the Trump that is uh, now in power is that he's uh, surrounded himself with a number of top advisors and, and people who uh, have a much uh, fully fleshed out uh, thought processes, and they are not going to be impulsive, and they're not going to uh, react just basically on the on the basis of uh, what's staring them in the face. And Steve Bannon is one of those, and um, he's scary to me. He's absolutely scary to me. Uh, what do you think? I mean, am I am I crazy or am I? Well, he said a war with China is inevitable, which runs a chill up my spine because I think if me that's too. the case, we have to double down on our efforts to avoid a war. We have to do everything we can because it will be catastrophic. It w it could be nuclear. It could cause. Uh, worldwide catastrophe of unimaginable proportions that I do not accept. We should just just allow happen. Why would he want a war with China? He will not say that he wants a war with China. He will say a war with China is inevitable. For example, he'll say that the Chinese are pushing us around down in the South China Sea, or the Chinese are uh, not allowing uh, enough uh, freedom of the elections in Hong Kong, or the, the, there, there's all kinds of things he, that he can come up with. There's all kinds of tripwires in the U.S.-China relationship that every administration up to now has studied very, very carefully and worked on in uh, dialogues with China, we well, basically the U.S.-China relationship is built on we've got about a, a hundred different issues, some of which are never going to be solved. So we have to contain those and keep them from getting uh, blowing out of proportion because if they do, we're going to have a war. Mm -hmm. the, and then the others, let's just work on those uh, because we can make progress on those. And because we've had that kind of a policy, we've had a very good relationship. And if we start to, to fiddle around with those uh, other issues that we know are tripwires, China calls them their core interests, uh, we're playing with fire, and we will probably have a, a conflagration. And this is what Mr. Bannon, I think, believes. Is he, we have to go over there and, and, and retool uh, all of those um, uh, uh, intractable issues that we, that we have with China. And that's a mistake if we do that. And why is it a mistake? It's because it will lead to war, a, need, a needless war. We do not have to have this. The world has benefited greatly by the stability in U.S.-China relations for the past 40 years. And the next 40 years are going to be truly wonderful if we can find a way to coexist with China. We do not have to necessarily be their friend. We just have to understand them. And they have to understand us. 
and we have to find a way to focus on the issues where we can make progress and not allow those other issues that could easily uh, blow out of proportion to anything to happen to, to uh, upset them. Let's, you know, I want to talk about the next 40 years because I think we think generationally rather than a lot of people who think about today, tomorrow, and next year. And for us, you and I, who have been to China a lot and understand how they think, in the U.S. it's very difficult for a lot of people to understand that. So I want to talk about the next 40 years. But before that, I want to talk about some of these tripwires. And one of the tripwires with us, the building of bases or, or, or airfields or whatever you want to call them in the South China Sea. It, could you explain to our audience what this is all about? I'll do my best. It's a very complicated issue and we don't have a lot of time. I will just say that uh, China has been in the business of making China great again for the oh, past... That sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> They've been in that business for the past 40 years. And they are not monolithic. That is to say, there are factions within the Chinese leadership, and one of them is the Chinese mil military, which is very assertive. And, similar to ours, similar to And the, one of the key issues that they have is the uh, integrity of China's borders. And um, Sounds familiar, so but they can't build a wall, Take right? Tibet, take um, Hong Kong, mm -hmm. take Taiwan, and take the South China Sea. Those are four areas that the Chinese have uh, said for a long time those are in integral parts of China. Mm -hmm. The South China Sea, they have this nine-dash line, which in my personal opinion is way overblown and way out of proportion to what it should be, but it, 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 um, it overlaps with the... Uh, the territories of the Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, and um, uh, China, that is to say, the China uh, on Taiwan. Is it a strategic uh, issue for China? It is a strategic issue for China. They want very much to to reclaim those, those uh, rocks and put mm -hmm. sand out there and build runways out there and make them capable of at least landing a fighter uh, plane or a jet plane and maybe putting in an anti-aircraft uh, installation. But um, at least you're not going to have a brigade of troops stationed out there. They're rocks. They're, really, they're, they're, they're just they're not that big. Rocks, yeah. And by the way, China is not the first nation to reclaim uh, those rocks mm -hmm. in this in this disputed area. There are already um, uh, reclamations being done by Malaysia, Vietnam, and the Philippines, the Philippines okay? right. and Taiwan. Even on uh, Chinese uh, New Year's Day a year ago, uh, the outgoing president of Taiwan, Ma Ying-jeou, flew to Ituaba, an island that is part of the disputed area, where the Taiwan government and the military have built a base and have people, have troops stationed there, not very many, I don't know how many, but not a lot, and it can land and take off. I mean, the, the big problem with what China is doing is the size. It's just so enormous. It's like five or six times bigger than anybody else has done mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. And so therefore it could, it could be used as a military base I very quickly if they wanted to. Okay, so as a, as a tripwire, as you as call a trip it, wire. it's, uh, you know, we see it as a potential issue. The question is, why do we care? We in the U.S. as normal, as ordinary citizens, do we really care? Or is it our military that's pushing the agenda? Or is Bannon pushing the agenda that we have to stop China from building there? And it's not Bannon pushing the agenda, particularly uh, on this particular issue, because the issue has been growing in importance in U.S.-China relations for the past several years as the Chinese have been reclaiming these lands long before Bannon became an influential mm -hmm. figure. Uh, our military has, uh, has worried, I think rightfully, about the freedom of navigation, about the right of passage because it's a major area uh, for the world's uh, shipping to be going through. They want it to, to be unimpeded and they don't want the Chinese to be able to say, uh, this is our area and for you to go through here, you have to have our permission. Right. And if you don't get our permission, I mean, the Chinese have been very pushy about um, uh, other area, other countries doing fishing in certain areas right. down there, but um, the jury is still out on whether or not the Chinese are ever going to do anything that will upset the um, strategic value or the strategic importance of uh, that, that area. 
Jay, we, uh, we have to take a break, but I want you to think about this before we take the break. The, uh, the trade policy of uh, Mr. Trump mm. and uh, his assertion that he's going to be uh, putting out some trade barriers mm. or trade tariffs, and we're going to talk about that after the break. Mm. But I think that's one of, for me, because I'm a businessman who does business in China, and I've been an importer for 30 years from China, uh, it's, it's an important issue, and I want to know how the Chinese are going to react to it. So uh, uh, we have to take a short break. I'm, I'm fascinated whenever I talk to Jay because he is such a specialist. I still call him an expert because that's my term for him on China. Uh, you're watching Seymour's World on Think Tech Hawaii. We'll be back in a minute. Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you excited about my new show, which is called Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. And it's going to be on Think Tech Hawaii from downtown Honolulu on Tuesday afternoons, 5 p.m. And we're going to talk about uh, to make architecture more inclusive on the islands, which is, what, which is one of the definitions of humane, which is being tolerant of uh, you know, many people, of nature, of many other influences. So we're going to have some great guests, like today's guest, for example, uh, my collaborator, David Rockwood, who is the author of the awesome um, manifestation of uh, humane architecture in the background. So see you on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. I look forward to. Welcome back to Seymour's World on Think Tech Hawaii on what I think is one of the most important topics of the day, and that is China-U.S. relations under President Trump. Uh, with us today is Jay Henderson, my very, very good friend, uh, a man who has traveled in China for many, many years. My God, it's 40 years. 40 years. For me, it's 37. For you, it's 40 years. So you and I have discussed China at length, and we both seem to have the same feelings about China. But we need to discuss what we talked about just before the break, and that's trade. Tell me about what you're feeling. We know what Trump wants to do or what he says he wants to do. What do the Chinese feel about that? Well, the uh, Chinese are busy going their own way. And, for example, the Asia Investment Infrastructure Bank that they started because uh, we basically uh, uh, wouldn't work with them on uh, allowing enough capital for them to be able to achieve the development goals that they wanted to, to achieve, accomplish. And we didn't join, but the British joined and the French joined and the Germans mm -hmm. joined. And so <coughs> and then we had the <coughs> TPP, mm -hmm. uh, which was very carefully crafted and involved a lot of nations uh, signing on and, and, and at political cost to themselves. And now President Trump has said we're not going to, uh, uh, we're going to back away from the TPP, thereby leaving the entire um, regulatory structure and regulatory regime for trade in Asia up for grabs. And the Chinese are going to come in and, and try to uh, I think they will. put some kind of a, get the upper hand sure. on the baseball bat. Yeah, I all think right? they will. Because we have ceded it. Um, <clears throat> the, 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 the trade with China is going to continue. Um, it, it will change. That is to say, ch uh, it will continue at a huge level. It will grow. It will change. Uh, there will be much more Chinese investment in the United States. I was hoping you would say that, Jay, because everybody's focusing on the other thing. They're focusing on the products we're bringing in, have to have more tariffs, et cetera, et cetera. I can tell you myself from my consulting business, I have more Chinese companies asking me about buying U.S. companies or moving into the U.S. than ever before, much more, sometimes maybe in in, in 2016, five to six times as many companies from China asking me to help them set up their operations here in the U.S. Well, there was a report done by the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations and the Rhodium Group about um, Chinese investment in the United States, and I think it's basically succinctly to said it's it's doubling every year, and right. it's up to 80 billion dollars a year yeah, now, and yeah. probably this year will be 160 billion, and. It just shows that the Chinese have a lot of confidence in the United States as a market where they can make money. Yes, there's no doubt in my mind that we need to focus more on the positive relationships between China and the U.S. If China is willing to invest in us, if they're buying hotels right here in Hawaii, mm -hmm. we know they're buying hotels and property, etc., they're doing that all over the country. And of course, notwithstanding, they're doing it all over the world. We know that. But I feel that the relationships we have with China are going to be very, uh, very good relationships. I disagree with you a little bit that a war might be coming, and you know that's what uh, I. 
I know that's what Bannon says, but I think that when it comes to relationships, China and the U.S. will have strong relationships. But if they don't, there are going to be allies and there's going to be adversaries as well, or adversaries as well. Do you think there is an issue of who's going to line up with China? I mean, Russia, will they line up with China or is it going to be other countries? <laughs> Go ahead. Every country in Asia is asking themselves that question at this point in time. Where are we on the, in our relationship with the United States vis-a-vis -vis China? There was a, a long article in the Australian press uh, yesterday about <clears throat> uh, Trump, Trump's uh, phone call with Mr. Turnbull, the, the uh, Prime Minister of Australia, mm -hmm. hanging up on him. And then after that, Turnbull sends his foreign minister to Beijing to talk about what are we going to do now? <laughs> so it's a an evolving relationship for every one of the Southeast Asian, excuse me, <coughs> every every country in, in, in Asia. Go ahead, well, <coughs> a glass of water. While, you know, while we're talking about that, Jay, and we're talking about the countries in Asia that are going to support China or are going to follow the U.S., I, I, you know, I really don't think that's going to be the big issue that everybody is making it out to be. What do you think? I don't either. I think that rather than having a win-lose, uh, friend and adversary kind of a setup. We we, we have a possibility for win-win, where everybody can prosper Tell and us benefit. About that. that would be if we go back to what I said about before the break, <clears throat> about having a stable relationship where we keep the hot button issues contained, and work on the areas where we can make progress. And the areas where we can make progress are huge, and there's quite a number of, of areas. Let me give you one example that I really like to talk about. It's called the One Belt, One Road Initiative from China, where China is saying, we, need, we want to uh, uh, go on the old Silk Road and build a whole series of Highways, trade yeah. entrepots mm -hmm. between us and all the way to Paris or London. And they want investment to go out there and, and do that. Well, they're willing to build the infrastructure. We can fill in around the edges and we can prosper from that too. But rather than join in with the One Belt, One Road, we're, we're standing back. That was even under Obama. We were ha having a standoff attitude towards the Belt Road Initiative mm -hmm. and President Xi Jinping. I think we should seize the bull by the horns. That, that's a tremendous opportunity for American business uh, with the Chinese raising funds to build infrastructure that they will profit from. And then there's all kinds of ways that we can uh, be part of the supply chain, maybe being the dominant source for the but one But you see, as a win-win as situation, how do we get that across to Mr. Trump? Are you listening, Mr. Trump, by the way? If you're watching the show, I want you to know that we want to have a good relationship. We don't want this negativity of looking at what the problems are rather than trying to, trying to feature what the good relationships could be. And I think you're right, Jay. There's definitely a win-win. But we seem to focus on the negative, don't we? Well, I think the Chinese are, are handling uh, their relationship with uh, the new administration very, very adroitly. And uh, not only could, should you look at what they say, but you should also look at what they do. And one of the first things that they did is, <clears throat> and you cannot say that the Chinese foreign ministry sent this man, uh, Jack Ma, right. who's the head of Alibaba. Small little right? company. Yeah. Small little company. It's, he appeared and he uh, talked with Mr. Trump. And when we came out, there were all smiles. I don't know whether that was um, a chess a photo move, up, yeah. a chess move or not. But basically, I think the Chinese, and I can see it from the blogosphere that I follow on U.S.-China relations. I can see that um, the Chinese want to. They recognize that Mr. Trump is susceptible to flattery. Mm -hmm. And so what you do is you flatter him, and then you tell him what to do and, and how, to, how to behave and what to say, mm -hmm. and then you thank him and leave. Mm -hmm. okay? And that's sort of what they're going to be doing with him. Uh, and that's, that's a, what, know, that's what they first, did with Mr. Ma. That's the first time I've heard that, Jay. And I have to say it is it is a pleasure to hear it because I, I think you're right. I think Trump is still an enigma to many of us. Uh, you know, a lot of us think he's a blowhard. A lot of us think he doesn't know what he's doing. And a lot of us think he's not listening to his advisors and all he does is tweet at night. And, you know, stupid things like that that you shouldn't be thinking about a president. But I think that if we approach the relationships between the U.S. and China, 
that. In just that way, where we understand each other's, uh, uh, each other's strengths and each other's weaknesses, we're going to be able to do a good job between the two countries. That's my feeling. Now, what is the, what do the people in China think of Mr. Trump? I'm talking about the everyday citizen. What does he think when he looks at President Trump and says, this is the leader of the, quote, new free world? Um, some of the people in China, there's, there's no universal uh, yeah. accepted opinion yet in yeah. China. Some of them think that he's great because he's going to destroy America. <laughs> <laughs> some some of them think that uh, he's great because he's the kind of leader that, uh, well, they, they recognize making America great again is exactly what China has been trying to do for making China great again and, and uh, not putting up with any nonsense and just bulldozing his way through. Um, they may like that, and then of course there's a lot that a lot of uh, people that are worried about the instability that he's going to cause in U.S.-China relations that will cost the Chinese people. Do you feel that the 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 Chinese government we're talking about, you know, from the top down? Do you feel that there's a fear of President Trump, or do they feel that they could do exactly what Jacques Ma did, which is come to the United States and make deals with them? And I mean, uh, uh, Trump. Uh, if there's one thing about Trump, is he's a deal maker, and he loves making deals. So, do you think there's going to be some type of quid pro quo via trade where there won't be any, uh, uh, you know, dumping of steel, for instance? That's a big issue. Do you think that's going to happen, that there's going to be some type of arrangement made where we're going to eliminate this, well, China has been taking us to the cleaners for the last 20 years, which is what Trump has been saying. Yeah, China's been taking us to the cleaners, China's manipulating its currency, oh, all of these right. things. Uh, yeah, I think there will be some kind of, a, uh, of an arrangement worked out between China and the United States that uh, both sides will accept, and it will have to be made out of whole cloth because right now everything is up for grabs. Uh, the top leadership, I think, are still uh, trying to find the best way to relate to the Trump administration. And um, just look at what they did, for example, when um, uh, President Xi and President Trump had their phone call. The Chinese foreign ministry spokesman came out onto the stage, walked out and gave a 45-second right. uh, address saying, this is wonderful, we're happy to see that President Xi and President Trump are talking to each other, and that President Trump has agreed with the one China policy. Thank you, goodbye. You that, know. That was it. Well, you know, that's, that's part of how China deals with, uh, with a lot of things. And of course, Trump has to learn as, uh, as we go along. Jay, I have to tell you that uh, we're almost at the end of our program. Uh, you're leaving for China in a couple of weeks, I understand? Yes. And I just got back, and I'm going again uh, in, a, in, a, in a couple of months when I have to go over there. Uh, what, uh, what is your feeling about China? Are you confident that it's going to continue on this road upwards there, or do you think it's going to be flat for a while? Well, I've started going to China when everybody was riding bicycles, yeah. and I've seen, as, as a lot of the world has seen, the tremendous progress they've made, but I think it's a big mistake to think that they're on a plateau. I think the, their progress is going up, and it's going to continue to go up, and that we are... Uh, uh, making a mistake if we underestimate the future of, of, of China economically and otherwise. There's a tremendous opportunity for Americans here if we only play our relationship with China right. And the future could be very rosy if we didn't have it be a win-lose situation if we had I a win-win. I, th I agree. Jay, uh, we're out of time, so I have to say thank you, and I want you back again because, believe it or not, we had double the amount of items that we covered on our list, so we have to do this again. And to you, uh, my audience, I thank you very much for watching our show today. I think um, uh, having somebody like Jay on the show, not a political guy, not a pundit, but somebody who really knows what the inside of China is all about is absolutely worth listening to. Uh, I'm going to be back in a couple of weeks with a brand new show. For those of you who have sent me all your emails and texts and calls about how I'm doing with my cancer, as you can see, I'm doing fine. I'm still playing golf. I'm still playing tennis. I'm traveling around the world. Next week, I'll be in uh, Whistler, British Columbia, and Vancouver. And then next month, I'll be in Sydney, Australia. And the month after that, I'll be in Germany. So it never stops for me, and I thank you for all your good wishes. I hope to be here for a long time to come, and I hope you keep watching my show. Uh, thank you very much for watching Seymour's World on Think Tech Hawaii. See you again. Thank you, Jay.